Let us pray. Gracious God, may your spirit come now in word and in power to move within our hearts and open us on your path of discipleship. For we pray it in your holy name. Amen. When I was growing up as a child, I used to love to read comic books. Anybody here read comic books when they were little? Anybody still read them? Some do. Uh, all right. Okay, that's all right. It's all good. Um, I would read through the comic books, and I particularly liked superheroes. Superheroes were wonderful because anytime there was a problem, whether it was a robbery in progress or life was being threatened or there was a potential of a natural disaster of some kind, a superhero would be there to save the day. And it just took a matter of 30 pages, or if you watch the serial ones on television, 30 minutes, and it was all wrapped up and everything was good and life was uh, safe again and everybody was wonderful. And, and I can remember, I, I liked Spider-Man, I liked Batman, but my favorite was Superman. My favorite was Superman because number one, it was American, it was kind of cool, red, white, and blue and the whole whatnot. He was invincible, he could fly, which what kid doesn't want to fly, you know? And he could do all these wonderful things. And any time there was a problem, you'd hear the call go out, this is a job for Superman. Let me hear you say that. This is a job for Superman. That wasn't loud enough. He went to hear you. This is a job for Superman. There we are. Now you're awake. OK, very good. And so the call would go out, and Superman would come in and save the day. And there are times in recent um, news cycles that I wish there was Superman. Because the world seems to be in turmoil in so many different ways. We look at the economic turmoil brought about by Brexit. We, we look at the turmoil within in, the, in our own country, both the unrest of the political season that just seems to be unending and just going forever. Um, we look at all of the brokenness among people. We, we look at the ways in which terrorism and fear have become an underlying layer of who we are and how we travel and what we do. In fact, I just had that conversation with someone recently about air travel. We look at the world around us and there's the growing evidence of the drug epidemic and homelessness and hunger and, and we wonder to ourselves, if only there was a superhero, a way to just swoop in and fix it all in a 30 minute episode or 30 pages of a comic book and make it all good again. And as we look to the future, we, we want to see that sense of peace, that sense of wholeness, that sense of caring and compassion among people. But it doesn't always work that way. And we may find ourselves wondering, Where's our superhero? Even Jesus, who came into the world to teach us about God's love, who died on the cross for us to give us spiritual salvation, couldn't eliminate the very sin that put him on the cross. That was the goal, to share gospel love and quash the forces of sin and death. But even Jesus couldn't do it single-handedly. Jesus overcame death and promised each of us that if we are spiritually connected to Christ, that indeed there is a salvation for us, but we still live in and among the world around us that struggles with all these human-created issues. And we wonder. Jesus knew, though, that he couldn't do it alone. So he called the 12 disciples symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then once he had the disciples in place, the gospel tells us today that he commissioned 70 more. 70 more with specific instructions to go out into the world, kind of like feelers for him, to all the different places where the gospel message needed to be heard. And he sent them out We'd like to think they went out like Superman, all bulked up, ready to go, energetic, feeling invincible. 
my sense is they probably went a little more like Frodo. Anybody know who Frodo is? Anybody here read the Lord of the Rings? See the word Lord of the Rings? Frodo was this little hobbit, little tiny hobbit, who came across a ring. And that ring needed to be destroyed because it was the key to corruption and evil in the world. That's your nutshell version. And Frodo was sent out to destroy this ring on a harrowing journey that was going to be both personally um, make him vulnerable and, and could hurt him, but also it was going to be an arduous task trying to maneuver his way to the place where this ring needed to go. And he begins to express fear and uncertainty and why me, why now? To which the wizard Gandalf says to him, we cannot choose the time in which we live, but we can choose what we do with the time we have. And I think that's sage advice. We cannot choose the time in which we live, but we can choose what we do with the time we have. Much like Robert Fulham in his book, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. You all, are you all familiar with that? Jesus gives us an instruction manual. It's not quite as simple as say please and thank you and share and hold hands when you walk across the street, though that is in there. It's a little bit different. Jesus calls the 70 together and says to them, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. Are any of you tradesmen or women? No? Tradesmen like it when there's few people who know how to do their job. Because when something happens and you need them, you call and you don't have 50,000 choices, you have a few. And they know how to do what they do well, and therefore they know they have a vocation for quite some time. They like it when there's fewer in number. Discipleship is very different. Jesus wants more. More disciples are better than few. And so Jesus calls and says, look, there's a lot of work to be done. There's not enough. I'm sending you. That message is still valid for us today. And he tells them, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Ouch. Anybody want to sign up for that? Show of hands. Nobody? Nobody's chomping at the bit. I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. What does that mean? Part of what it means in today's world is if you look at the influences that are in place in the world around us, especially for young people, but also for us as we grow and gain more wisdom, the world tries to tell us what we need to do to be righteous, to be good, to be accepted in the eyes of culture. And the ways in which the world does that are often ones that set us apart from each other rather than pulling us closer together. There's a lot of influences out there. And so as disciples, when we go forth and try to bring a message of gospel love to others, that's not always received well. And it can be personally harrowing as well as upsetting for the culture as a whole. Because God wants us to be one family. But we as humans find ways to divide ourselves even when we're not consciously doing it. And that makes the task a little bit harder. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the instructions, all you need to know, the basics. First, go out in pairs. He doesn't send us out there as rogue agents by ourselves or lone rangers. If we find ourselves acting that way, we've missed it. We've missed it. You know, if you pick up a twig and you go to break it, it'll break pretty easily, won't it? For the most part. If you take two twigs and put them together, it's a little bit harder. And if you put more twigs together in a bundle and try to break it with your hands, it's almost impossible to do. The illustration Jesus gives us is to go out in pairs. Why? Because we're stronger with one another. It's better that way. You have skills that the person next to you doesn't. They have skills that perhaps you don't either. 
And he says to them, take nothing with you. Now, as somebody that just unloaded a truck and a half of moving supplies, let me tell you, that one is a hard one to understand. Take nothing with you. No luggage, no food, no water, no clothing except what's on your body and the sandals on your feet. How many of you would go on vacation and take nothing? Anybody? How many of you, when you get up to go to work in the morning, would take nothing? Me. <laughs> It's one of those things where we have those security things, our cell phones, our wallets, our purses, our keys. We, we like to have those basics, a credit card maybe, or cash in our pocket. We like to have basics with us when we go out. Jesus says, take none of that. Rely on God's purpose and God's faith and God's spirit to guide you where you need to go and give you all that you need. And then the next instruction is find a house knock on the door, and offer the peace of Christ. And if the person receives you in peace, then go and reside with them, accept their hospitality, eat with them, bring healing to them. Studies have shown that just conversation with another person can uplift a person's um, chemistry in their body and make them happier can bring them to a place where it brings healing for illness and sickness. Just that touch of another person or that caring or knowing that someone else loves you or is concerned for you is enough sometimes to pull people out of the pit and into a place where they can hear God's love. Take nothing with you, trust in God. When you go into that house, you go in pairs, why? Because one of you may be able to offer peace because we have all those preconceived prejudices and issues and things inside of us. The other may have a hard time with that depending on the situation, but the roles may reverse. Maybe the person having a hard time with bringing peace is the one who can bring the caring and the healing. It's funny how God works. We, we foil off of each other. My strength might be your weakness, your strength might be my weakness, probably is. And so Jesus sends them out, take nothing with you, go, reside there, bring peace. And if you don't have a good reception, I love this phrase, go out and shake the dust off your sandals. Even the dust off your sandals and say goodbye. But don't just walk away, remind them that they have had a foretaste of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come near. Maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe the reception wasn't meant to be. But God is still there. And the same is true for you and I. We are called to be disciples, to follow that playbook, that instruction guide, and go out into the world. So why is it so hard? Why, after 2,000 years, isn't everybody there? Why do we still have turmoil and uncertainty in the world and lack of peace? I think there's a lot of reasons for that. The most important of all of them are the in other influences working against God's will. The second to that is our own vulnerabilities. How many of us like to be vulnerable? If I asked you all to get up right now and introduce yourself to everybody else and tell me a little bit of your life story, how many of you would be ex immediately comfortable doing that? And how many, of you would be, how many of you would be hesitant? Not sure what you should say. I don't like to talk in front of people. It's OK. You're with friends. See, even this part's hard. There you go, OK? We don't like vulnerability. So to put ourselves out there and share our faith, which is something so private to us, is sometimes really hard to let go of and share with someone else. So there's the vulnerability factor. What's going to happen if I try to do this? There's also the fact that sometimes it's not on our time, it's on God's time. And so we plant seeds and we may never ever see the fruit of God's labor. But it'll happen somewhere down the road. There'll be a click and a reminder. Remember, pop goes the weasel. Click and a reminder calling us back to remember 
oh yes, I was there when XYZ was there and shared the gospel with me. And now I know what that meant. See, this really is a job for not Superman, for you and for me. So we're going to try this one more time. I'm going to say this is a job for, and you're going to say your name really loud, okay? We're going to try this one more time. Ready? This is a job for... Listen to that beautiful chorus. This is a job for... This is a job for every one of us because Christ is calling us forth. And when we go forth, you probably wondered what I picked this up for very quickly as I close. This is a boomerang. Everybody know what a boomerang does? You throw it out there, and if you throw it properly, which I still have not been able to do, <laughs> it will come back to you. And the love of the gospel is like that. When we send it forth into the world in our words and in our actions, a little bit comes back to us at the same time because we grow in our faith and in our love of God, but somebody else receives it as well and it will come back and it comes back in blessings. Today, God, Christ is calling us to be disciples. The call is making disciples, going forth, bringing others into God's realm. It starts now. It starts with the person in the pew next to us. It starts with the family you're going to spend Fourth uh, of July with or the friends or significant others. It starts with the person you meet in the supermarket this week that may be having a hard time and you can just guide them to the right place. Maybe it's an employee at work or maybe it's just a friend, someone you know or the stranger on the street. By offering words and actions that share the gospel love, you may not even have to mention God's name. We bring others into discipleship. Why? Because you may find some place in the midst of that conversation to share that you are a person of faith. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are a disciple. And everything you do and say, no matter where you are, brings the kingdom of God into the realm of someone's life. Today, Christ is calling. Are you listening? Christ is sending us forth. Will you go? May God bring blessings upon the hearing of God's holy word. Amen.